and welcome back to the Faculty Factory Podcast. I'm Skrupski here at Hopkins looking at my friend and colleague, Dr. Guadalupe Federico Martinez, or Dr. Lou as we call her. Hi, Dr. Lou. Hello, Dr. Skrupski. Nice to be here. Uh, we, Lou and I go back to the AAMC, Association of American Medical Colleges Group on Faculty Affairs, Research a Project Development Subcommittee, it was called. And then we did, gosh, we had such a great committee. We get, had two workshops on scholarship and getting papers published. And you were such a great teacher. I remember you when you did your, your segment of the teaching, you used it up. And I'm like, oh, rock star, rock star. You're so good. Such a natural. Dr. Lou is amazing, folks. And guess what? For the past 17 years, Dr. Liu um, has been at the University of Arizona, and until recently, she was the Assistant Dean of Faculty Affairs and Career Development in the College of Medicine, an Associate Professor in Internal Medicine, and drum roll, I wish I had a real drum, blah, 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 blah. Now, Dr. Liu is a wellness counselor and consultant coaching on organizational culture and wellness. And today she's here to talk about diet. Yes, diet. We're going to talk about diet. So Dr. Federico Martinez, why are we talking about diet on the Faculty Factory podcast? <laughs> A great question, Kim. So <laughs> when I say diet, we're, I'm kind of talking about how we sustain ourselves as faculty. And for faculty development leaders out there, I I wanted to discuss this idea around organizational wellness and what could be the diet there to feed and sustain our faculty so that they can have the longevity in the multiple career phases that they're going to have in their life, right? Because these careers are very long ones. And um, so, you know, when we think about, well, what is organizational wellness? And, and that really means how do your leaders, including yourself and your role as a, as a development officer for faculty, um, how are we supporting healthy behaviors that influence how our colleagues treat each other, influence each other, work together closely, respect, and how we're including everyone. Because we know that when we feel like we're being included and we belong, that is influencing sort of your emotions and your career planning and how you're experiencing the academy and how much your chairs or your, your division chiefs and your deans are supporting this for you. And so with wellness, I in my experience in this role, when we have these discussions, there's sort of a default reaction to the term wellness. It starts to engender immediately, you know, the, the physical aspect. So Dr. Bill Hetler has, um, out, out of the National Wellness Institute, has six dimensions of wellness that he often articulates to leaders. And I feel like in our current roles, when we have wellness discussions, we default to the physical dimension. That's one out of six. And we've, we're missing the discussion around emotional, spiritual, social, intellectual, and occupational. And as faculty development leaders, we tend to live and operate around the social dimension, intellectual, and occupational, obviously, given the, the nature of the job. And so when we think about wellness, it's it's often tied to healthy behaviors. And when we think of healthy behaviors, we think of diet. And if we can consider what are we ingesting, what sort of behaviors and experiences, messages, expectations are our leaders and ourselves giving to each other in terms of ingredients? And so I think keeping our organizational wellness wrapped around this idea of our core ingredient for the diet is inclusion, including each other in core messaging, and communication, important meetings, important social activities, that will give much of us the sense of belonging that we need to have career sustainability. Oh, oh Lou, I love this. And I love the metaphor. Of course, I'm thinking nourishment, nourishment, nourishment. And 
isn't it ironic that we can overlook fundamental nourishment that that if you think of Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we need food, water, clothing, shelter, the basic fundamentals to keep operating. And yet we, you're, you know, right, when we think about wellness, just, you know, we can, we overlook all these other dimensions. Just, just say, you know, throw down a yoga mat, use a call map and get yourself straight. Move on. <laughs> we don't have time for all this stuff. It's, it's an incomplete diet. It's like having a diet of all, you know, fast digesting carbs. You have to have the, the ma- other macronutrients. So tell us more about what does a, a healthy organizational culture look like? How how does that feel when we all know that not only do I fit here, but I belong here? Mm-hmm. So what might it look like? It means flexibility. It needs camaraderie. So there's a special focus there on that social dimension as part of our diet. And you can't have camaraderie without experiencing respect and inclusion and truly working as a team. And so when we turn blind eyes to a couple of uh, exclusionary behaviors and such, then we're not fostering that appropriate diet. It's not sustainable. Right. And I, I did sort of want to talk around this concept of, of of career sustainability. So when you had mentioned about this idea of nourishment, we we often think about the term sustainability historically as one associated with the economy or environment. Right. We're focused heavily on the environmental aspects. These are strategic ways to continue being able to live on the planet right? Reusable energy and reusable materials. I think the same can be applied to our careers. So I think that uh, an organization that is focused and prioritizes wellness has either a standalone office or dedicated programming, dedicated FTE, focused FTEs that can help foster this type of environment. Um, And so at this term career sustainability, I do want to give credit to two very good friends of mine and colleagues, um, Beth Schirmer and Rosemarie Christofalo, who I believe coined that term. Um, And really, I think it's around giving our faculty permission to enforce boundaries, to allocate their time appropriately. And, And that sort of circumscribes the type of inclusion and respect for people's time and boundaries. So t- tell us what that looks like, the boundaries. I think that's so important. And I coach faculty every day. And one of the threads is time management and inability, perceived inability and reality of no space to manage all that time, like being reactive instead of proactive not having the independence, the autonomy to determine the course of their day. Yeah. So I think we we have a lot of autonomy in theory, but we have been grappling for the last three decades, really, with the pressures that come with mergers and acquisitions, Mm -hmm. kind of the way the the academy, especially in medicine, has changed over time, um, really requiring us to align uh, more on the corporate end. And I feel like we're attempting to blend traditional academics with medicine and healing, compassion for people, right? And plus corporate the corporatization of medicine. And I think those are what creates those competing interests. And this is really going to be a tectonic shift in mm-hmm. how leadership sort of manages people and the time. I think in medicine, we have had a culture for many, many, many decades that it, this really comes with the job, but you're married to the job. It's a really intense, right? Scheduling and hours and demands. And during medical school, we're socialized that that's going to be the expectation. I think that there's some great challenges ahead with our new generations 
who are really prioritizing this space in their own wellness as well. And they're really challenging. They're pushing back. They're, they're a courageous group in the generation. And I think that they understand the importance of well-being, that constant pursuit of feeling good about yourself emotionally and physically and mentally, and how that has bearing on patient care and how that has bearing in their own research and how that has bearing in how they teach and mentor the following generations. And so I think that department chairs, division chiefs, leaders who want to really retain a core group of people who are who are in fighting shape. I'm going to say I'm sort of stealing this phrase from a, a, a division chief of uh, our trauma division, Natasha Carrick. But I, I love when she says, you know, people do their best when they're in fighting shape. And sometimes to do that, we're going to have to let go of some traditions of how we work our faculty around scheduling and also allowing a space for them to have reprieve to either go part time or 0.75 or allow for a year of shifting of their workload allocation, right? So maybe some of the clinic time stays where it might be, but they reduce in research or maybe reduce a bit in teaching, which is going to reshape recruitment for that leader. But we need to find ways that we allow people to not have a stigma around shifting their FTEs or reducing FTEs and going back to the schedule as a division, as a group. And together we design the scheduling because when when people have their hands in the schedule or they're making decisions together, creating mm-hmm. solutions together, they have more accountability to themselves and to the, the team, truthfully. Instead of putting the, the division chief or the chair on the spot, mm-hmm. you know, whether they approve something or not, they came to that conclusion as a team. And I think it's easier to follow through on promises like that. And also, I think it diminishes the stigma of, um, you know, sometimes if you go part time, there's still that stigma of, well, she or he lacks commitment to the job. And she lacks resilience. You know, she signed up for this, didn't they? But, you know, we're we're in a post pandemic world now. And even faculty, physician and non physician faculty have reevaluated some priorities and those priorities around their own health and things at home. And the healthcare system has to grapple with that mm-hmm. as well. And I think that's where some of the trepidation is with the discussion around how can I shift my FTEs so that my I have bite size assignments and I can fit this in the time that I need to. And that's, that's, it's really scary to enforce the boundaries. I think we all know what boundaries we need, but having that discussion with leadership can be scary. Mm -hmm. And what I'm asking for is, is leaders to allow that space. And I think you'll, we'll have better faculty and better patient outcomes and better retention, which will lead to cost savings. Dr. Liu, thank you for, yeah, thank you for bringing this to the table and opening this conversation, destigmatizing choice and boundaries and seasons of life that require flexibility and pointing out that that flexibility um, works hand in glove with the camaraderie, the social support, the working together as a team, the recognizing that um we kind of push pull. It's like a dance. It's a waltz. It's the tides in the ocean that for a season, for a moment, this is going to be how we're going to do this. And then we're going to shift here. And then we're going to constantly in flux, but creating a culture where it's not this regimented thou shouts, rather, let's see what evolves. Let's see what we can become as an institution, as a department, as a division, as a staff as a clinic staff as a as a laboratory as a people what can we become if we fully allow that that the possibilities so let me dr lou let me say to you well you know 
back in the day when I did research, I was in the office at six in the morning and I was the first one there and I was the last one out the door. I would sometimes work, do all nighters, one or two in the morning. If you can't put in that kind of time, you might as well get out. I mean, it's tough to compete um, for funding. You got to put in the time. Um, and you want you want to make a make a splash in the world and make a name for yourself clinically. You got to see all the patients you can. You got to take all the call. You got to be in in the hospital. You got to be working with the trainees. You got to close your notes. You got to make sure that you are there all the time. How can how can you possibly be successful in academic medicine if you're not a hundred percent in it? What do you what say thee, Doctor Lou? I would say I totally agree in terms of the work ethic and that expectation. And I think that is doable, but it's it's only a matter of time. I could probably commit to that for four to five years of my life, hmm. maybe even a decade if I've got nothing going on at home. Yeah, and that, that's what I, I say. I've, I've had people tell this to me and say, oh, you and faculty development, you're just, you know, walking around blowing happy gas. You're just this <laughs> cheerleader, you know, making, you know, these make sure faculty are happy and well and wellness and all this stuff. It's just back in the day, that's what I did. And I always think, yeah, back in the day, but golly, how did you manage with all that time you were spending in the, I mean, I'm, I'm right. Like you have kids, right? Well, yeah. Geez, Louise, I mean, who fed those kids and who paid the bills and who did the grocery shopping and who did all the errands and who did all the Amazon returns and who did, who, oh, well, I had, my wife did that or Support I, oh, well, good for you. Or <laughs> So back in the day, the good old days, we're not going back to the good old days. And you write, you know, Lou, that younger generations, different values, not bad, they're different. They're mm -hmm. rounded up. They want to work. In institutions where the values are aligned, that there is engagement and caring with the community and the world at large. And yeah, I'll be better with my patients. I'll be better with my trainees. I'll be better with the learners. I'll be better in the lab when I feel like you see me as a full, complete person. Yes, right? that's the key. People want to be seen as the whole self. They're a person. They're, we're not machines. And I think historically, it's like, how can you contribute to the broader machinery? What is your component? And that doesn't work these days. I, mean, I think these are some of the reasons why the ACGME, uh, along with the importance of sleep, we recognize that residents and fellows now need adequate sleep to minimize patient errors, right? <laughs> and so there's that limitation on duty hours. And so I, it, we also, and there's no limitation for duty hours for the faculty because, right, you buck up. Yeah. Uh, however, I, we have we have two income homes now still with, with kids and things give this type of a schedule and demands. I think people are, are amped to do it and work hard and prove themselves and earn that credibility. But it will only be for a sustained period of time before they burn out and then they reject you and then they resent the entire profession, resent the employer, resent the experience and beat themselves up for it and then move on somewhere else. And um, well, at least for me, people are not disposable. I like to see people for who they are. And um, I, I would not want people to sort of walk away from my team. And so I, I, I would think that our our generations to come will continue sort of with that message about valuing other dimensions of their persona, which mm -hmm. means family itself and the rest of the world. There's other things going on in the world that are just yeah. as important. Um, so my advice to those leaders are you can you can squeeze that out. It'll it'll be five years or ten years and and then that's all you get kaput. But folks are not machines and we're not intended to be machines. And I think we gotta respect that turning of the tide now. Dr. Lou, in your new role and your new your new endeavors here as a wellness counselor, consultant and coaching on organizational culture, um, can you tell us a little bit about what you can provide for faculty members, leaders, organizations? Can you kind of give a little like commercial tickler of like what we can gain by working with you. Yes. Thanks for that time and space. 
Um, so uh, independently outside of, of uh, the academy, I'm happy to meet with faculty one-on-one -on -one with regards to their management of their own wellness and well-being. How does that relate to competing demands with home and work? And how can I help you create smart goals and a pathway and a steady diet of nourishment mm -hmm. that's going to feed your want and zest to continue on with the role that you have at home and the role that you have in your professional life. And then secondly, I enjoy, and I will be working with institutions on their own organizational wellness strategic plans. So helping facilitate group discussions through retreats, also one-on-one -on -one meetings, but mostly with group discussions for planning and solutions-based work. I love, I love that. I just, I love the sentimentality about this. So I don't want to say sentimental, but I love the, the tone and the posture that you're bringing this because I can see you, Dr. Lou, back when we had that over 200 people at that workshop, two years mm -hmm. running, and your presence, your, your leadership, I can see this as making a huge difference and giving leaders, institutions, faculty members permission, permission to live their life that they are meant to live and to respectfully challenge some of the, this is how we do things around here. It's a yeah, yes and total respect for traditions, absolute respect for leadership and for how we in our institutions got here and being courageous to say the yes and uh, this isn't working for me now or I can hold this course for a little bit longer but I feel like the wheels are starting to come off and I'd like to encourage us to go here or go there or how about if I dial back a bit my I have young kids and I want to spend you know they're four and seven and I want to spend time being with them and making memories with them and then come back or you know I'm Repivoting. I don't want to do a K award because the K the K is going to take me to an R, and I don't want to be that person. I love this so that the the power and the you know the freedom to choose. And I think you're right that 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 wholeness will it can't do do anything but you know um, just nourish the whole population, the patients, the learners, the leaders, the institutions. It's it's tough times out there and people are changing and the institutions must pivot. So I think you're in the right place at the right time. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I'm going to leave the, the final words to Dr. Guadalupe Federico Martinez, who is our new wellness counselor and consultant, will coach you and your colleagues around organizational culture and wellness. I love the, the Dr. Bill Hutler's, you know, the six dimensions and making sure we focus on all of them, the physical, emotional, spiritual, social, intellectual, occupational, and and pushing into some of those places that maybe we're not comfortable always talking about, you know, the emotional, the spiritual, um, the social, and trying to find ways to be full and be, become the becoming. I'm, I'm kind of like lately fixing on, on the becoming who are we becoming? What are we becoming? But I'm going to stop talking there. Leave it to you, Dr. Lou. Why don't you close this out? Sure. Well, thanks so much for this space. And I just want to remind us all that we're all part of one large community. And organizational wellness will give rise to that culture. And our organizational culture is how we do things here at our school, at our site, at our hospital. And I think the most important key is the climate, organizational climate. And that's how your staff perceives that it feels like to work and live and love in that space. And we want to give them the best experience that we can. And as development representatives and leaders, I feel proud to try to help bring in the best out of these institutions so that we can welcome and, cu and cultivate and nurture our faculty into the best that they can be at this time as they continue their journey evolving and becoming, as you said, helping the becoming. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, Dr. Lou. If you want to get a hold of Dr. Lou Federico Martinez, you can email her at gmartin150 at gmail.com. Say it one more time for us. gmartin150 
150 at gmail.com. All right. And it'll be on the website with Dr. Lou's profile. And you can go there and check her out. And if you want to learn more about it, please contact Lou for wellness counseling, coaching, consulting. And if you want to also be in the podcast, you can be on here as well. Thank you, Dr. Lou. You're wonderful. I'm so excited for you. Hey, everyone. It's your podcast producer, Casey. Just wanted to let you know that as of March 1st, 2024, this podcast has had nearly 89,000 total downloads and YouTube views from listeners in 95 different countries. The website, facultyfactory.org, has drawn over 41,000 web visits from users in 122 different countries. I tell you all of this just to underscore the point that this truly is an international platform, and we want to invite you, no matter where you are in the world, to be a guest on our show. Our host, Dr. Skrupski, makes the experience very engaging, relaxing, and fun. As producer, I'll make any of the edits that you might need on the back end before we publish it. We want to hear from different faculty around the world and learn from each other, so please reach out if you'd like to be a guest or to nominate someone in our academic medicine community to be a guest. You can visit the Contact Us page on facultyfactory.org to send us a message or contact Dr. Skorupski directly at kskorupski at jhmi.edu. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory Podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.